Kurt Cameron is an actor. He has been since 1979 when he advertised Serial. Six years after that, he was in Growing Pains, which is the only thing in his Known For section on Wikipedia. Which is a shame because there's so many other things he should be known for. When he was 17 years old, he became a born-again evangelical Christian. And then he demanded Growing Pains to censor their content of anything he found objectionable. And then he did a lot of Christian media, which led him to here. Join me today as we dive into the insane world of Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas, or simply, Saving Christmas. So Saving Christmas has an interesting background to say the least. It was produced by acclaimed film studio, um, Liberty University, a bastion of Christian values in the United States. We also have CamFam Studios, Kirk Cameron's own production house, and XDX2, a studio whose entire filmography is this, and the free speech apocalypse. Wonderful, we're in good hands already. Now I also want to give some background on myself, because Kirk Cameron has built this narrative of the movie being sabotaged by atheists. I won't say what I believe, but I'm not an atheist. I don't have any prejudice against Christian or religious movies. In fact, some of my very favorite films are based on religious tales, or have very strong Christian themes. These are timeless stories, sometimes among the oldest in the world, and they can be powerful to all people regardless of faith, delivering wisdom or hope across millennia. This movie is not one of those stories. The film opens with studio logos, and then we see the man himself, Kirk Cameron, sitting down and talking to us, the audience, for almost four minutes. Well, this is only a good sign for movies. He tells us what he likes about Christmas, and begins to discuss people who want to stop Christmas from being celebrated. There's this one group over here that says, keep it in your house, don't let it spill out into the public and bother the rest of us. Yeah, I expected as much going into the- And then there's this other group over here who's telling us, you know, everything you're doing, all this stuff, it's all wrong. It has nothing to do with Christmas. Huh. So he's also talking about Christians who don't want to celebrate Christmas. Okay, this is an unexpected angle. But let's see how this goes. Perhaps we might be surprised by an actual discussion with thoughtfulness and- What are they gonna do next? Tell us hot chocolate's bad for us? The, the, the druids invented it? Never mind then. So we get another studio logo, which must mean that that was just the prologue, which must put us at... Okay, so we got the prologue out of the way, and now cuts to this man being greeted by a girl who tells him... He's here, sir. Where? What? <laughs> this got so intense all of a sudden, why? We get some narration about stories and how we tell the same stories to our kids that we heard as kids, but that we might tame them down? And then... Uh... Okay, more credits. And finally, the movie actually starts. We see a big holiday party, narrated by Kirk. And then we see Darren Doan, writer and director of this movie, playing Christian. Kirk's fictional brother-in-law. Christian is feeling grumpy though, kind of bringing the party down. He's worried about materialism, greed, and uh, elf worship, apparently. You just don't know someone's story until you see what's going on inside his head. <laughs> what the heck is going on in this movie? Now, at the moment, I want you to notice the lighting, and how amateurish it looks, and a set which just looks like the inside of a family home. Now, I don't want to insinuate that they just took the production budget and used it to throw a massive holiday party on their own house. So, I shall do no such thing. We also meet their friend, DeAndre. How you been? <laughs> you know me, blessed and highly favored. And? Saved a sanctified field with the Holy Ghost, and that with a burning fire. 
And? Made evident by speaking in tongues. Of course. <laughs> you guys in your verses. It, is that racist? I, I, I'm pretty sure that's racist. Anyways, Christian goes out to the car, and Kirk follows him, asking him what's wrong. And Christian explains. I, and I look at her, I look at, I, look at, I look at the food, I see the presents, I see, I see, I see the tree, I see, I see Santa. And that money spent, how many kids could we have fed? How many wells could we have dug? Yeah. That's Christmas. Wow, that's a very powerful sentiment, actually. Maybe this will actually be a thoughtful and meaningful film that- You're all wrong. What? So, Christian demands to know how everything in the party works towards promoting the ideas of Jesus. Kirk decides to start by discussing the snow globe with the nativity scene inside. Okay, that's a transition that happened. We're told to think of a stone cave, to think of a manger to feed the animals, and to think of Herod's genocidal soldiers murdering babies in the streets. What the hell, Kirk Cameron? Or Darren Doan, whoever thought of that? Okay, okay, let's just keep going. So he draws our attention to the swaddling cloth. We usually only think of the baby Jesus being wrapped in cloths. But the Bible brings these cloths back into the story one more time. At his tomb. When they rolled that stone away. So I'm not sure, but I think he's implying that the clothes that Jesus was swaddled in were also his burial shroud. Uh, let me check. Uh, no, it's not listed in any of the four Gospels, at least in the New International Version. So, uh, yeah, people are coddled in fabric as babies, and if they're buried, they're often buried in some kind of fabric. That's a real stunning observation. And yeah, that's the point of the whole thing. That's a mind-blowing aspect we're supposed to take away. Well, that and... I feel like we need to have, like, little Herod soldiers, like, all around, you know, the... No! No, you should not! <sighs> okay, but even if that argument did make sense, it does not. Good job, you've proved that the nativity scene, the biblical story of Jesus' birth, is linked to Jesus and the Bible. Forgive me for not being impressed. We then cut to inside, where DeAndre sits down with one of the friends. What's really going on here? No. No, 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 I don't. Three words... War on Christmas. Oh no. Sugar Free said, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. They're already taking away our freedom of speech. I can't say Merry Christmas at work no more. I have to say Happy Holidays, but I am not in the days. I am wide awake. It's deeper than that, though. You heard about Area 51? What about Area 52? That's where they're keeping all the mangers and trees and nativity scenes they keep taking down. Speaking of down, you know why the Pope really stepped down? Da Vinci Code, right? Wrong. There's a whole Picasso Code. I'm actually still working on that one. Come on, man. They got fluoride in our water. I'm saying that's got to cause at least ass burgers. Speaking of burgers, you probably ain't even had one in years. That ain't no ground beef, homie. That's pink slime. I seen it on YouTube. Look it up. You know what you gotta do? Get like me and wifey. Strictly ostrich and emu meat, homie. Delicious and exotic. Come on, you got the chemtrails and harp trying to control the weather with the womp, womp, womp sounds. Then GMOs and pesticides. You know there's a huge honeybee shortage, right? Exactly. Colony collapse disorder. Oh, that rhymes with New World Order. Coincidence? I think not. I saw loose change, I know what's up, with the whole Koch brothers, Halliburton, Dick Cheney, Enron, Fannie Mac, Freddie Mae tie-in, but I mean, that's obvious. Look, man, I saw it on Fox News, so you know it's true. War on Christmas, it's everywhere. Hey, who needs more coffee? Oh, no, we're good. Delicious, though. Was that supposed to be funny? What was the point of that scene? It almost reads like it's satire poking fun at the War on Christmas crowd. Except, this movie also plays into the War on Christmas rhetoric. I'm hopelessly lost and frustrated, and we're only a little over a third of the way through the movie. Christmas trees. Newsflash! Christmas tree! Not in the Bible! 
this movie has a weird fixation on what is and isn't in the Bible. I mean, there's more to theology. There are centuries of work by Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant figures. There's also a weird fixation on dialogue and having it go on and on and on. I'll close my eyes again. Here I go. I'm waiting. Okay. What's the chapter? What's the verse? Over here, it's your verse in Numbers. Where, where, where am I going? Where do I start in the Bible? Christmas trees, I'm waiting. Where do I go? It's almost like this concept wasn't nearly robust enough to fill a feature film and is instead getting dragged out. But anyways, time to see how Christmas trees are biblically okay. The whole biblical story starts in a tree lot. No, it doesn't. Uh, can we just skip to the end of the argument? You know, Adam picked the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and to put it back, Jesus died on a cross. So when you walk into a Christmas tree lot, I want you to see hundreds of crosses. Please do not do that. Okay, so the third and final main argument of the car section is here. Santa Claus. And guess what? Santa got in the car, kicked Jesus out, and was like, rolling, 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 and took, and just took it. Gone. Christmas is gone. It's all about Santa. It's like a We're false. in the Bible. We're in the Bible. S-A-N-T-A. -A. Rearrange the letters. Satan. Santa, Satan. Same letters. Wow, that's the kind of thing a sixth grader says as a joke. And this is played totally straight. And who's completely gotten rid of Jesus? Satan. Santa. This is seriously the level of arguments this movie is going for. Hold on, I see his face. Oh, I see his face. The real Santa Claus was a real bad, bad dude. You want Christmas to be all about Jesus? You think you're fighting the good fight? Let me show you how a real defender of the faith does it. <clears throat> uh, Kirk goes on to tell us the story of St. Nicholas, Bishop of Myra, the real-life inspiration of Santa Claus. He was there at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, one of the most important events of church history. The Council of Nicaea ended up producing what is known today as the Nicene Creed, a profession of faith used by churches all around the world. W wait a second! The Council of Nicaea isn't in the Bible, Kirk and Darren. The Nicene Creed isn't in the Bible. What's the matter? Can't keep your own rules straight? Come on. Let's go bless some kids tonight. We've got gifts to give. <laughs> Stop smiling like that. Ugh, how much longer do we have on this? God damn it! Christian goes back inside, determined to enjoy Christmas, and delves right into a pile of presents. Ooh, work, Holy Spirit! Ha! Can I get an amen? I see yeah. The scales are falling off. Glory! Ah! Glory! Mm. Okay, I'm pretty damn sure this is racist. Christian looks up and sees the presents stacked under the tree, and Kurt Cameron says that we should imagine them as the skyline of the city of Jerusalem. Do I even have to explain why this is a dumb point to make? Can I move on? Thank you. Christian goes over to his nativity scene now, and... No. Remember those soldiers at the nativity? These were Herod's strongest warriors doing his bidding. Every toy soldier can be a reminder of the whole story. No! No! That thing's bigger than the rest of the nativity scene! Are you serious? Yeah, okay, it's like saying we should put up British flags on Independence Day. Except even worse, because Herod's soldiers were slaughtering babies! <sighs> Christian apologizes to his wife, and they share a moment, and then... I went ahead and just organized a hip-hop dance crew that encompasses all the joy and gospel burst and excitement that... I alone as one man just cannot express. Oh no. Oh man, I got just a track for you. How about some Family Force 5? Angels, we have heard oh hi. <laughs> Come on people, let's do this. Oh. Angels, we have heard all night. Sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply. Echoing their joyous strain. And 
Then Kirk invites them to the feast. And what follows is the single most infuriating part of this entire movie. And don't buy into the complaint about materialism during Christmas. This is a celebration of the eternal God taking on a material body. So it's right that our holiday is marked with material things. That's right. He says that materialism is good for Christmas. What's after this? The credits? Again? All right, I'm calling it here. And let me tell you something about Christmas, at least from a literary and historical perspective. Step back with me to around the turn of what we call the Common Era, or about 750 AUC, that's since the founding of Rome. Judea has not yet recovered from the Babylonian exile nearly six centuries prior. And while Rome is relatively light-handed in its rule, what remains of the Jewish people in the region still toil under foreign domination. They have been promised a savior though, a messiah, a king of kings who will restore the kingdom of God. These prophecies are by now 500 years old when that savior is born, but not born in the way you'd imagine. Even if you aren't a Christian, I'm sure you've heard the story so many times it becomes rote, but really consider the nativity from a thematic viewpoint rather than a religious one. A prophesied king is born to a carpenter's wife in a stable. He is witnessed by the three magi, who were Zoroastrian priests, and when the news is delivered by angelic choirs, it is not to the local nobility, but to the boys tending the sheep. And across the four gospels, the story they tell is the same. This prophesied savior did not come as a revanchist conqueror like many expected, but as a clement pacifist. He did not just come to save the people of Judea, but the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people too. The story of Christmas is a tale of hope. It's about finding that hope in unexpected places and in unexpected ways. It's about the birth of a man who, regardless if you consider him the son of God, a heretic, a prophet, or just some dude who lived in the Middle East two millennia ago, promoted mercy and tolerance and pacifism to a degree that was radical at the time. None of that is in Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas. It is unintelligible nonsense that openly celebrates excess. Did you notice how Christian's point about how much he could have done with the money for the Christmas party was just never addressed? It's not a Christmas movie. In fact, I barely think I can call it a movie because there's no plot or theme or idea tying this whole mess together. It's a cynical exercise in exploiting Christian audiences, and I'd recommend watching virtually any other Christmas movie besides this one. That concludes this video. Thank you for tuning in today. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, and also tell me if you have any other movies you'd like me to discuss. If you want more of me, you can subscribe, or you can follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd for more updates. Until next time, I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and thanks for watching.